So first of all, thank you to the organizers to allow me to present my work here. Um, I'm Laura Fanfarillo. I'm going to talk about pneumaticity and superconductivity in strongly correlated multi-orbital system. I will focus mainly on iron-based superconductors. Uh, I'm replacing a talk here, so I'm going to switch a bit the angle. I'm not going to talk about transport and uh, non-fermi liquid uh, uh, behavior. I'm talking about bad metallic phase and what we can understand uh, about iron-based superconductors starting from that point of view. So the question uh, come, uh, is motivated by the observation that in many quantum material, you have a high temperature, a bad metallic phase, so you can call it stranger metallic phase, whatever you want, it's an unusual metal. And by lowering the temperature, you have uh, the emergence of uh, a number of uh, different phases uh, that can be accessed uh, tuning, uh, a tuning parameter, and in particular also a conventional superconductor. So this is a general topic. You can think about cube rates, iron based superconductor, the phase diagram of avi fermions, and so on. But I will focus on iron based superconductivity because uh, essentially, um, I think that we developed uh, over the years in this system a kind of dichotomy. Um, we have uh, uh, well understood the phenomenology of the bad phase in terms of Hund's metal. And uh, from the other point of view, we can actually explain pretty well the emergence of the ordered phase using some weak coupling theory uh, in which spin or charge collective modes are responsible for the emergence of these phases. Um, and uh, you can think about, okay, these are high energy renormalization that I can incorporate in this uh, weak coupling theory some, with some effective mass or so on. So my point being that maybe uh, this is not the whole story, and actually my question is, are actually uh, the, the correlation characterizing the bad metallic phase somehow favoring or maybe not working against the emergence of this uh, ordered phase? So it's not enough for having a renormalization, but maybe that there is a not trivial interplay. So in this talk, I will focus on uh, the effect of uh, this, uh, um, the property of the bad metal on pneumaticity and superconductivity. So in the next two slides, I'm just sketching uh, a few information about these two phases. So superconductivity in iron-based superconductor uh, is uh, unconventional, and in the majority of the system is well proved that uh, it's, not, uh, it's, uh, it's not possible to be explained with an electron phonon uh, mechanism. It's multi-band, you have several orbital close to the Fermi level that form different bands, and you have that uh, the superconductivity is uh, um, realized opening the gaps on the different bands. And um, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, a weak coupling theory based on es essentially on the exchange of spin fluctuation between uh, nested uh, band at the Fermi level, in particular whole band in gamma and electron band on X and Y, are, uh, it's, uh, it's a well, uh, a well uh, uh, provide a, a good description of the superconducting phase and the phenomenology. What about uh, pneumaticity? So the pneumatic phase is a rotational symmetry. Uh, it's a phase in which you break rotational symmetry, but uh, the translational symmetry is preserved. In this system, uh, it's realized uh, uh, at, the, at the structural transition between a tetragonal and a thrombic phase in which the XY lattice uh, uh, parameter become an isotropic. Uh, this actually, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the anisotropy is uh, um, uh, observed in all the electronic properties, so you can look at the resistivity, for example. And what is clear, what there is a general agreement now, is that uh, the origin of the uh, nematicity is electronic. So it's not the lattice that is producing the anisotropy of the electronic properties, but it's the opposite way around. A good candidate are spin fluctuation, charge fluctuation for the... Uh, uh, what I want to say in this topic, uh, it's completely irrelevant. So essentially, I have a picture in which both pneumaticity and superconductivity can be derived by some collective mode, let's say spin fluctuation. Um, and uh, let me mention, just because I will talk about that bit later, that uh, uh, the anisotropy is observed in a number of probes, including ARPES, in which the XZ orbital and the YZ orbital are uh, degenerate in the tetragonal phase, and then you break the symmetry below the pneumatic temperature, as well as, for example, in neutral scattering. So you can characterize the pneumatic phase with a number of probes and this uh, well-studied uh, um, uh, issue. So let me go to the normal phase. So I told you that the normal phase is characterized by strong correlation. 
you have a bad metallic face uh, has been studied through many different probes so that, the orbital, that there is an orbital selective character of correlation. So each orbital experiment a different degree of renormalization essentially. And uh, there are a number of uh, uh, experimental evidences that I have no time to go through, but uh, one, for example, is the anisotropy that you have. This is the undoped compound, and essentially the correlation are decreasing if you dope with electron and increasing if you dope with hole. So this and a number of other has been explained in terms of a theory that is uh, essentially the physics of the Hund's metal. So this is the only part of the talk that I have to ask you to believe me, that you can take the whole experimental picture of the normal phase of the metallic state of iron base, and believe me that you can describe that as a Hund's metal physics. And now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to explain you what I'm calling Hund's metal, just to keep going with my talk. So a Hund's metal phase is realized in a, essentially in a correlated multi-orbital system out of our filling. This is the case of iron-based superconductor, so all the D orbital of the iron are very close to the Fermi level, and if you look at the atomic limit, you have to accommodate six electrons in five orbital. So you, real, you immediately understand that if I dope with the hole, for example, I'm getting closer to the half-fill case. So if you have some reminiscence of the single band case, you will uh, remember that uh, that's the case of the Mott insulating uh, uh, the metal insulating transition. So let me start from a single band Abbar model, a paradigmatic Hamiltonian for correlation. So I have the kinetic energy term in the Hamiltonian and the Coulomb repulsion term, so electron, electron repulsion locally on each side. And uh, this Hamiltonian essentially describes uh, very well two limits. If I have the, um, the ratio U over uh, the bandwidth, uh, it's uh, controlling uh, the uh, phenomenology of this system. So if a U is small, the bandwidth is defining a well-defined metal, and let's say that the quasi-particle weight is just one in the uncorrelated case. Um, in this uh, description, Z is just uh, uh, one over the effective mass. Um, so if I increase U now, uh, what I have, I have mainly two effects. One is acting on the quasi-particle coherent spectral peak that is reduced. And this renormalization is actually controlled by Z, that scale like, like 1 over uh, M star. The second effect is a, a redistribution of the spectral wave that is removed from the spectral peak, the coherent peak, up to high energy scale. That is, in the most insulated case, is uh, controlled by U. So then you can dope this system and you can recover some metallicity, but this is essentially the physics that you need to describe. So what happens now if I have many orbitals? This is the Hamiltonian. It's just a generalization. I have not only a Coulomb repulsion term, intra and interorbital, A, B, R orbital, but I also have an extra term that is the exchange coupling. And I'm rewriting the Hamiltonian like this uh, to let you see that essentially you have a Coulomb repulsion density density term that now scale like U minus 3J. So J equal U third is going to be a special line for correlation. And then J, that just try to maximize the spin and the momentum locally. So let's play a game. Let me put J to zero. So now this is just a trivial generalization of what I said before. I have, uh, for example, three orbital, and each one is a Mott insulator. Uh, it behaves like a Mott insulator case, so uh, as an upper model. So uh, if uh, J is small, I have essentially the same physics I described before, and uh, the ratio U over the bandwidth is the only parameter that is controlling the transition that is uh, realized through the uh, decreasing of the Z that goes from one to zero and the redistribution of the spectral weight on scale U. But what happens if J is large? So now the physics is real, strictly highly dependent on the doping. So let me focus on the doping that is relevant for iron base. So I'm, for example, in three orbital with two electrons. I'm out of all filling of this multi-orbital system. So what happens is that I'm plotting here Z as a function of U for different J. So the black line is exactly what I showed you what before. What are we doing here? Actually, I know that you're plotting calculated Z versus U, but what is the... This, is, uh, this would be analogous. You can, you can have the MFT no, and then what extract... what is this particular calculation of mass? Is it This GMFT? one, I think, is lay spin. What? Slave spin is a slave boson technique, oh, slave boson. but you can benchmark with the MFT, yeah. it would be the same. So you have Z that go from 1 to 0, increasing U. So now let me 
put a final j that is larger and larger, you see essentially two effects. On a small u scale, you have the suppression of the, of the quasi particle spectral weight even faster. But on the large u regime, you see that there is a long tail. And essentially, this is telling you that the effect of j is uh, inducing a bad metallic state that still is very robust. So z is small, but it will stay small even if you increase. And actually, on the limit line of u over 3, it's going to be like an asymptote, and you will have a robust metal even if you go to infinity in the model. Um, so I have not time to explain, but I think that uh, a very nice interpretation of this is like that there is a competition between u and j that will realize two different and opposite kind of insulator in the model, and that the, essentially the compromise between the two is this well robust metal. But what happened to the spectral weight that was the other quantity that I uh, described? So let me tra tra take the sketch that I showed you before. And now I focus on a u intermediate value of u, and I increase j. So essentially, the main result is not uh, nothing happened to the level of the coherent peak that stay finite, as I told you before. But the main effect is that the spectral weight that was on the energy scale of u is now moved back to a closer energy scale that is, again, related to the 1 minus 3j scale. So the upper bands that were on the energy scale of u now are much, much closer to the coherent peak. Um, so essentially, this is uh, what's defined the, I mean, I would say the interesting properties of the Huns metal, that if correlation, in a system in which correlation are controlled by u, there is a well-defined separation between the quasi-particle weight and the incoherent upper band. In a Huns metal, you have that there is a quasi-particle peak that is very close to the incoherent upper band, so that now live here, and then you have some higher energy incoherent weight. So there is now a complete decouple between, between the coherent and the incoherent part of the uh, electrons. So now, if you take in mind a picture in which superconductivity, nematicity, and the other order of phase of uh, a system are controlled by spin fluctuation that are characterized, for example, from a, a frequency uh, a scale that is of the order of some milli electron volt, essentially now all these guys are living in the same energy window. That is pretty different from something like in a situation in which the upper band are very far away. So now I expect that the incoherent weight can actually have a non-trivial interaction with the spin fluctuation, for example. And this is the key message of the talk. Now what I'm going to show you in the rest of the talk is just the application and the implication of this for nematicity and superconductivity. So let me start from nematicity. And I give you just uh, uh, two information about what experiments uh, see. So uh, I will focus on ARPES just because I like the fact that uh, using uh, different light polarization, I can uh, essentially individuate different, uh, I have orbital resolution. Um, and so as I told you before, you, when you're entering the pneumatic state, so you have a lifting of the XZ, YZ uh, degeneracy, orbital degeneracy. And uh, essentially in the ARP spectra, you can focus on two different effects. One is the pneumatic band reconstruction, so the splitting at the Fermi level, essentially. One is the spectral weight redistribution, and you need to access uh, higher energy range. So the first uh, uh, part uh, has been studied uh, since um, uh, several years now. And essentially, the most peculiar observation is that you have an orbital splitting that is uh, momentum dependent. So if you look at the orbital splitting in the whole pocket at gamma, has an opposite sign with respect to the orbital splitting you will observe at the electron pocket. The second uh, 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 part, uh, the distribution of the spectral weight, has been accessible in the experiments only recently by Stanford group, in which uh, uh, they, you see they access a larger energy window. And essentially, this, the result is that uh, uh, you find the differentiation of the orbital spectra, x, z, y, z, that is modulated in frequency. So here I'm just pu putting uh, a larger quasi-particle peak uh, enlargement. So you see that uh, very close to the, uh, the Fermi level, you have essentially that the x, z particle spectra is the majority. But then if you look at the uh, higher energy, there is the opposite uh, sign. So it's not like a rigid redistribution of the orbital. 
And let me say that this is difficult to explain with any theory based on weak coupling theory because you are on energy scale that are much, much closer to whatever the spin fluctuation can do. So um, I'm going to address this problem looking at the effect of uh, interaction and correlation on the pneumatic perturbation. And the approach is going to be, let me take the multi-orbital um, five-orbital model for the uh, iron. Let me plug the correlation and let me use a pneumatic perturbation that can have different order and the results are completely relevant if I put a ferro-orbital or a D-wave perturbation is going to be the same. So let me put some perturbation here that has a pneumatic character that differentiates S and Y. So I can do the calculation, now look at the spectra uh, and look at the pneumatic band reconstruction using the two different approximation. So only plugging the effect of the renormalization of the orbital uh, mass, and the other one in which I can use the full frequency dependence. So I sketch the result of the uh, calculation in which we use the quasi-particle approximation that we have done a uh, few years ago in collaboration with Lani Bascones that is here. And essentially, the result were uh, three main messages. So one was the Huns favor pneumatic order with more charge and balance. And so essentially, this sign change that is observed in the experiment is like uh, one of the order that has the lower charge and balance in the system. The second message is that uh, with the pneumatic perturbation, you are actually putting some uh, um, differentiation in the mass. So the Z, for example, would be already different. But the effect of correlation is that it will make this different larger. So it's enhancing the pneumatic differentiation of the quasi-particle. And the last uh, that I would say is the most relevant for experiments uh, uh, results uh, was that uh, what we realized is that whatever is the kind of perturbation we plug, J has the tendency to modulate the perturbation in a sign change way. So essentially, while you will have an homogeneous renormalization in momentum, J will drive a momentum modulation. So even if you plug a ferro orbital, you will have that kind of realization. And this is important because you cannot now drive, drive, drive out any uh, order just based on the fact that you observe a modulation because that could be just the effect of correlation. Um, what about the uh, physics beyond the quasi-particle picture? So I'm doing exactly the same calculation the only thing is that uh, since I'm using dynamical field theory to compute the self-energy, I have to reduce the uh, kinetic model to a 3D orbital system that is more, more manageable. Uh, but the low energy physics, you see the bands uh, composition and the uh, position of the bands is uh, the usual. And uh, since I already understand, understood what the effect of the Z, the effect in mass is, what I want to focus uh, is the effect of the dis different redistribution that I have in a system in which a correlation are controlled by U and correlation are controlled by J. So essentially, let me focus in a case in which I have, for example, U of the order of the bandwidth and the low J, large J. So Z is more or less the same, but I have a complete different uh, redistribution. You see here you have the upper band on the scale of essentially U because J is small. And here you have the all the weight here, it's uh, almost com uh, compressed in this uh, window range that is much smaller now. And then you have some incoherent weight left outside. So if you look at the uh, so solution now, so for low J, when I plug the pneumatic perturbation, what I observe is just a rigid uh, shift. So I have some orbital, that's the XZ weight that is on the uh, right and the, the other on the left. And uh, this is uh, something like a trivial result. But the situation is very different if I play the game and plug pneumatic perturbation in the Unz metal, because as you can see now, there is a complete redistribution of the YZ orbital that appear now at a higher frequency. So if I cut and look just the Occupy part of the spectra, I essentially see what the experiment see. That is uh, a X, sorry, and that is like, uh, a, a, a majority of XZ here and the YZ spectra here. And uh, the origin of this uh, is in a different behavior of the self-energy uh, that I can uh, compute in the low and in the high J regime. This is the imaginary and the real part. So from the imaginary part of this are Matsubara frequency, I can extract the Z from the slope at low frequency. You see that actually this is as the same qualitative behavior in the low and the high J regime. And in fact, it's just telling you that the Z are differentiated, but nothing is happening in the frequency. 
But from the real part, you see that uh, while in the low J regime, you have just uh, an anisotropy that is the same at all frequency, in the high uh, J regime, in the Hund's model, essentially you have that the opposite uh, polarization is realized at high frequency. So there is an intermediate energy scale in which you have the switch that is creating the difference. So uh, the conclusion, uh, I have just uh, one minute left, I guess. I'm going to tell you the superconductivity in that minute. So, so far, what I told you? I told you that in Hund's metal, you have essentially both incoherent and quasi-particle weight in a very close energy window. And I show you that uh, the dynamic part of the Hund's metal is needed to coherently describe the pneumaticity, so the, both the pneumatic uh, band uh, reconstruction and the orbital weight redistribution. So the question now is like, are these properties important for the superconducting case? Uh, so I have just a toy model that I can uh, summarize in that respect. So imagine that you have some uh, BCS-like superconducting coupling that is given by, who knows, spin fluctuation, maybe, some, some, somebody. And then you have electron electron repulsion described by U and J, as I told you before. And let me play this game. So I have the bare electron. I can compute the renormalization. And then I compute the BCS equation using this dress electron. So this is the BCS gap equation. And essentially, I'm plugging correlation effect in the calculation of the particle particle propagator. And again, I can do the game using only the effect of Z for the calculation of the propagator or the full renormalization. So what happens is that if I compute now the gap equation as a function of u for different, two different regime of j, if I use just the z, I have the same effect. The gap goes down. And notice that I don't even need to reach a point in which z is 0, like in the mod phase. If it's small enough, this gap is dying. And this is the same for uh, both the uh, large u and small, small j and large j. But if I now compute the gap using the full uh, self-energy, you notice that there is a difference. In both cases, the gap is larger. But notably, this effect is much, much more uh, pronounced in the large J limit. So essentially, the inclusion of the full energy, full frequency self-energy, uh, make the superconductivity more robust. And uh, uh, just to convince you that uh, this effect is coming from the incoherent part that is now closing energy, I'm computing, for example, the case in which I have for uh, U or the order of the bandwidth, uh, the same Z, but two different gap. So the booster effect is coming, in fact, not from the Z that is the same for the two case, but from the incoherent state that are much more condensed here. And this is actually something that you can check if you do a calculation in which you use a cutoff. So essentially, you have that when you use a cutoff, you realize the incoherent states close to the Fermi level up to U1, U minus 3J are participating in the formation of the gap. Uh, but uh, including uh, higher incoherent states beyond this uh, region is not doing anything. So the gap will be the same, whatever the cutoff is. So here is the conclusion. The take-home message is that uh, is a system of correlated electron in which uh, a correlation are controlled by U, the incoherent part is far away, ordinary or electron volt. In a Hund's metal, it's much, much closer. And so you have a non-trivial interaction with uh, whatever collective mode could make some uh, superconductivity, pneumaticity, or whatever you want in your system. Thank you. So my question in the first part, the regime that you are calling bad metal, where you have a peak but it's suppressed, uh, what is the, if you just don't do coherent, incoherent separation or anything, and my question is if you just calculate the imaginary part of the self-energy at the solution of the Dyson's equation, my guess is the imaginary part is always smaller than the quasi-particle energy here, right? Meaning, that's my definition of a quasi-particle, as you know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, understand. Everything else is word for me. Well, in this calculation, I can, you know, move U and J, so I right. can see the crossover, but I agree with you that in that regime would be... Right, so the that. bad metal is always has quasi-particles, well-defined quasi-particles. Oh, yeah, that's why I said before, I'm a replacement yeah. here. I'm so, not talking about uh, things without quasi-particles. <laughs> so, no, for example, when the mod transition takes place, it's yeah, really but, uh, what but until then, you always have quasi... I just wanted to make sure, because yes. often people call that regime, you know, 
no quasi particle, but that's not true in your calculation. I just no, no, no. Okay. What I'm telling you, I'm talking about a regime in which, uh, you know, the quasi particle is still there. So the z is finite, but it's very, very small. What I'm just arguing that u minus 3j is particularly scale of correlation that is important. Hi, uh, very nice talk. I'm here. Uh, one question uh, uh, regarding the dynamic part in nematicity. Uh, you are using um, ferro or some kind of nematicity, ferro orbital without sign change. Uh, and in that case, how, how does this work when you have a sign change of this uh, ferro orbital behavior? Because then now with dynamical mean field theory, you just have frequency dependence and not momentum dependence. So how does that, how does that work if, if, uh, the, the if result, they change? Yeah. The result was uh, truly independent from that. I mean, if you, rem if you remember our work on the quasi-particle uh, just renormalization, what we try was uh, ferro orbital and then sign change. And what we see that the effect, for example, of the Z differentiation was stronger or smaller. But as, uh, as, I mean, if you, if you look at the effect on the band, you take uh, a ferro orbital, for example, and you plug the normalization, you now see the band, how the nematic band are reconstructed. All of the splitting were going toward a sign change. So essentially what we have is that if you go to a strong enough U and J, all the order we plugged will, would realize a split. Yeah, no, no, I, sorry, the, the question I was thinking is, um, in, in this reorganization of the spectral weight that you have, because if I understood you correctly, so you have um, uh, one of the orbitals, it's uh, mostly concentrated, let's say, at lower mm -hmm. frequencies, and the other orbital is mostly uh, concentrated at larger frequencies. Uh, but if you have some kind of sign change in momentum that will... Uh, uh, probably, I, I don't know, so whether this it will was, uh, reduce this. What I'm this. telling you is that it was not affecting the behavior in frequency. So you would see the sign changes just in momentum, but it was not, so in, what I mean is that in the Hamiltonian, I would put the nematicity as a differentiation of the hopping, but when I compute the spectra, it was independent when I put the differentiation. It will give you the same result. Maybe we can discuss we later can discuss about later, yeah. what you mean and maybe missing the point. Uh, there are a question in some sense to put you, quickly. I'm very quick, yeah. A uh, question in some sense to put you in context with other talks earlier today. As you know, dynamical problems of both pneumaticity and superconductivity have been discussed in the context of quantum critical metals, etc. And there you get some frequency interval over which you basically, uh, your order parameter evolves as dynamical one. But it always was in this theory, the case that typical frequency is the order of, typical frequency is the order of the order parameter. FTC of 10 Kelvin, one MeV. So your order parameter is few MeV. You are showing up data on a scale of two, three electron volts, thousand, uh, almost thousand times larger. How can it be? So essentially what I'm telling you is that uh, for me, so in, in this plot, for example, so U minus 3J is not of the order of uh, two electron volt. U minus 3J, that is the window that I'm telling you, it's like key, it would be like uh, in this calculation, maybe 300 milli electron volt. It's much, much smaller. Yeah, but somehow what I'm telling you is that what's happening in this, so let me talk about 200 milli electron volt is giving you a renormalization in the spectra at 2 electron volt. So somehow it's telling you that whatever correlation effects to me, what are doing is taking a small energy window in which these effects that you mentioned are relevant, so the, the, the order parameter, for example, and are, and are connecting those to higher energy scale through this not trivial interplay. So somehow I think that that's what, what is going on. Uh, but I think it's interesting to understand better. So, hi, here. So I have two quick questions. One is, in the model that you have, 
Do you ever get a nematic instability as a spontaneous symmetry break in your system, or do you have to put it by hand, as you're saying? So that's question number one. Question number two, I understand having different orbitals splitting at gamma and m. I'm not so sure I understand this uh, orbital, uh, momentum-dependent orbital order, because uh, if I'm not close to these high symmetry points, uh, they're always going to be split and, 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 and hybridized and so on. So I, I'm not sure I understand what it means to be changing sign at a, at a different, uh, if that's meaningful in this yeah, regard. Yeah, 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 okay. So the first question is no. I have not generating any pneumatic instability from uh, local interaction. Uh, so the, the whole spirit of this uh, talk, I think, uh, I, I try to, to say is that if there is uh, a driver of this transition, you could think like, okay, this is completely disconnected from uh, the physics of uh, high energy that create incoherent state uh, controlled by you. What I'm saying is that they are not controlled by you, so now the interaction is not trivial. But there was no way that we could generate a pneumatic instability looking at the local interaction. The opposite, they were suppressed. But I think that there were, what was interesting in that case is that if you have a ferro-orbital, this is strongly suppressed. If you have uh, something like uh, a D wave or so what, whatever pneumatic perturbation, in this sense is sign change, I'm perturbing the hopping in a modulated way in the original Hamiltonian, that was something that uh, Huntz was happy to conserve and uh, do not, without suppression. So I'm talking about sign change, if you want to look at the bare pneumatic perturbation that you put it as a cosine, cosine, sine, in the experiments, uh, this uh, plot that I was showing to you um, was from experiment, and so they were just uh, looking at the orbital uh, uh, band splitting, and this is what they plot. But it is not what I mean. We can talk more later. Yeah. And I, and I think that's it for the program today. I don't know. Do we have a? General question. Have 15 minutes. Ah. May, may I ask a general question, which is connected to what you ask and also to Laura's talk? So we had several talks today. I mean, we, we know that if you could solve an interacting model, we, we wouldn't have even the need to talk about low energy, high energy. So we take the model, we solve it the zone. And many approaches, are, for example, this quantum critical point that were discussed, are based on the idea that you can really separate a low energy physics, which is eventually a metal, then there is a collective boson, which is there, and the two things are completely the couple, and I try to understand how they behave together. Then, for example, Laro was trying to say, okay, but you can have complicated features where what is low energy or high energy really depends on which interaction we put, okay? So the question would be, how may, okay, of course, I, I know that we don't have the answer to this question, but uh, how controlled are uh, our decoupling scheme based on a general problem? So there are situations which you can really decouple high energy from low energy, and there are situations where this decoupling is really depending on what you are looking at. Eventually, even to the experimental problem you're looking at. I don't know if anybody of today's speaker or somebody, somebody else who wants to comment on this. Yeah. Oh, I, think oh, I think a general discussion, right? So, uh, so, uh, Okay, if I can say a word on this, that's what I tried to say to uh, Laura. Uh, you can forget about separation between high energy and low energy and solve the problem as it is. And then you had your dynamical order parameter, which normally decays at some power of frequency. And the question is, what is the scale at which it decays? In all problems that I know about, the scale at which order parameter decays is comparable to amplitude of the order parameter. And then, then so you the get... gap is milli-electron motor, then everything... Is... Right. So we only have to focus on what's going on in the milli-electron motor range near to the Fermi level. Unless, unless there is a very slow decay. And then you go to... My... Alternatively, you take all high-energy physics, it renormalizes your effective interaction at low energy, but then you use it to solve dynamical problem for the order parameters. So. That's exactly what I was saying in the sense that if you look at the pneumatic spectra, they, I mean, they do not define the, uh, a dynamic pneumatic order parameter, so I don't know exactly the, how to define the scale in that experiment. 
but the redistribution was relevant up to scale that were higher, higher, even of the U, J, whatever, so U minus 3J. So what I'm saying is that uh, there is something, some non-trivial interaction between electron living on different energy scale that are producing effect that even if are not appearing in the scaling of the dynamic order parameter, are affecting the spectra, for example, for the pneumatic uh, um, um, state because the change were up to three electron volt that are much higher of whatever energy scale we were talking about. Yeah, so, so it seems to me that uh, this separation is intrinsic to putting in the quantum criticality by hand, right? When you're putting it in the coupling and so on there, I mean, unless you're starting with the Hamiltonian, but you solve everything, you have to do the separation artificially. There is no escape, okay? And, and although I agree with what uh, Andre is saying, but I think there is no escape. It's a feature of the theory being somewhat incomplete, where we have one Hamiltonian controlling our system, feature and then you put in quantum criticality. It's a bug. It's what? A bug. It's not a feature, it's a bug. Well, I don't like it at all, but I'm calling it a feature because it's well known I don't like it, okay? So, so you know, so I'm trying to be polite in my old age, okay? So the, the point is that as long as that feature is there, you have to divide the two energy scales, one for what Andre was talking about, the critical properties, and one for other things. And I, I don't know how to solve it, but I don't see an escape from this. The idea is, I mean, how much we, because sometimes it looks like, of course, we start from model we construct by scratch like this, as you said, the low energy plus a critical boson. And then we try to compare with, with the reality, and then, uh, you know, we have to hope that it's going to work. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I don't feel any obligation to defend it since I never do it. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it should be. So just a quick question. So if, as Henri suggested, maybe the dynamical um, order parameter has a very slow decay in energy, but what ultimately selects the two EV energy scale instead of any other intermediate energy scales? So uh, I was just trying to, maybe is there an intuitive understanding what is so special about the two EV energy scale? Why do we have this feature? From the result, right? Yeah. If it just have a very slow featureless decay in energy, but what's so special about two EV? No, but I think that this problem is that the energy scale characterizing, I mean, about that experiment specifically, mm -hmm. is that there is a modulation in frequency. So like orbital selective coherence. Mm -hmm. that, and I don't expect that, I mean, as I showed you before, what I was expecting at first was like a rigid shift. Mm -hmm. You put an emotic perturbation, and you would see like something appearing uh, also at maybe some higher frequency, but I was not expecting a modulation, mm -hmm. because a modulation means that there is an intermediate energy scale mm -hmm. in which things are changing. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's the main point. So not, not really what happened at two electron volt, but is that it's different to what happened at the quasi particle. So it means that there is something intermediate that is producing an, an non-trivial result in, in my view. Okay. Maybe we can ask Shen because it's his experiment, so maybe he has something relevant to say. Other uh, comments or thoughts on uh... Maybe I can make a comment concerning this issue of how legitimate is to separate high energy scale. And, uh, this case of the um, uh, iron arsenide is peculiar because you have five orbitals. And this, uh, many orbitals have different interactions somehow. Uh, so you have some orbitals which look like uh, insulating. So if you just look at them, they look like a mott insulator. And some orbitals which are more metallic. If you keep this separation very strong, then maybe you can make some low energy physics for those orbitals which are metallic, and you can look at or simply neglect the other ones because you are just at high energy. Of course, if you are involving uh, collecting modes which mix orbitals, then you lose the possibility of keeping this two physics, low energy and high energy physics, separate. So it depends on your problem. So if you look at modes which mix orbitals so of one kind and the other kind, you probably have to work over low and high energy scale at the same time. If you look at zero sound mode 
only looking at density fluctuations of the metallic orbitals now, probably it is legitimate to look to make a low energy physics. So I think it's, in this sense, maybe cuprates are easier because they are only strongly interacting orbitals and that's it. And once you are in the metallic state, this is just a metallic state, it can be bad, strange, or fermi liquid, but it is just a metallic which is involved. So you can make this distinction between high energy physics and low energy physics. It makes sense to me. This is what I mean. Thank you. Other comments on uh, the proceedings of the day? Uh, no. People are tired enough that you can oh, let them you. go. Okay. <laughs> we can okay. let you go. <laughs> we will let so, you go. All right. Okay, so thanks again thanks. for the speakers.